whereas the 19th Amendment Constitution was ratified on August 18, 1920, which granted American women the right to vote, and whereas 72 years after the Seneca Falls Convention, the 19th Amendment finalized women's right to vote, one of the last barriers to women's enfranchisement in the United States, and empowered women to allow their voices to be heard through the political process. And whereas today, 93 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, women are making a difference in our local, state, and national elections by ensuring that our, their votes are cast to affect change at all levels of government. Now, therefore, I, Michael Dever, mayor of the city of Lawrence, Kansas, do hereby recognize the anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment and celebrate the women who work tirelessly to advance the causes of justice, opportunity, and prosperity for all Americans, regardless of gender. Margaret, could you come up and get this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Take care. Very good. It was on your birthday, too. They did that. Speaking of your birthday. All right, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, and all matters, matters listed on the consent agenda are considered under one motion and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussions on these items. If discussion is desired, then the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Uh, to the consent agenda, I'd like to add uh, claims to 296 vendors of $2,762,598 is there an item that the uh, member of the commission would like removed from the consent agenda? Mayor, if I could, item two, which is the claims that you just mentioned, and item number 4A, ordinance number uh, 8895, authorizing the sale of the Series A and Series 3 bonds. Very good, thank you. Is there uh, an item from the consent agenda that a member of the public would like removed? Seeing none, I would ask, uh, a appro approval of the consent agenda minus number item two and item 4A and with the addition of the claims to vendors. So moved. Second. Uh, mo motion by Commissioner Farmer, seconded by Commissioner Reardon. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Mike, can we speak to number two? Mayor, several months ago when we were uh, talking about Rock Chalk Park and the way that uh, uh, the um, uh, claims would be made and the payments be made on that, um, uh, we had a discussion about uh, that it would be uh, on the consent agenda and part of the claims package. I had, I had talked to Dave and I know it, several of you had uh, mentioned it too during the meetings about breaking the payment out, you know, the payments to go to Rock Chalk Park. I mean, my, uh, my record on voting here obviously has uh, been one of against. Uh, I will keep that up at this point. Uh, there will be times that I won't do this throughout the process uh, just so everybody knows that because you know, it's not going to change my opinion but going through the process but I want everybody to understand there will be any time that uh, payments are made that uh, they'll be broken out and people will be able to see them. So uh, that, that's my feeling on that. The other one on 8895 on item 4A just is, uh, again, consistency and vote uh, on that item. Okay, so would you like to approve the claims in, minus the Rock Chalk Park item? Yeah, if we could have two different votes tonight sure. and then, um, um, you know, as I go through them from time to time, uh, you know, as I see those payments being made, I'll ask to have them pulled Okay, the ones that I see. So okay. I'm going to ask for a motion uh, for the full claim total minus the $126,372.92. Second. A motion by Commissioner Shum, seconded by Commissioner Farmer. All in okay. favor say aye. Approve. Excuse me. Aye. All the claims less that one. Right. Okay. Aye. Aye. Those, those, those opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Uh, is there a motion to approve the claims for Rock Chalk Park for? Very good. Motion by Commissioner Shum, seconded by Commissioner Reardon. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion passes 4-1 with Commissioner or Vice Mayor Amix dissenting. And then item 4A, is there a motion to approve? Uh, Motion by Commissioner Shum, second by Commissioner Reardon. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion passes 
four one with Vice Mayor Amix dissenting. Very good. Uh, the city manager's report, please. Good evening, Mayor, members of the commission. A uh, few items in this week's report. Uh, Jonathan and others have worked on the launch of a Facebook page that got a number of uh, city uh, documents of a, of a historical background. So I uh, would commend that to uh, your review and, and reading. If you want to like that page, we would appreciate it. Um, we're starting the uh, rapid uh, infill, inflow and infiltration reduction program, um, starting off with some of the initial testing in certain neighborhoods to uh, find out where uh, some of the leaks are in the system, essentially. And uh, you see that, and uh, we'll be obviously uh, trying to do a good job of, of letting the, the community know that this is underway. As you know, tomorrow evening uh, in this room, uh, from roughly five to six, we're gonna have a public meeting where uh, we can respond to questions and uh, any uh, items that may come up as the public gets a chance to uh, look at a draft ordinance for a rental registration program. We understand that you all have not spoken to that yet. We think it was good to try and see if we can get any of the comments, uh, perhaps even make some uh, amendments to it before you would um, uh, consider it if, if we think that those are, are appropriate. Our wastewater treatment uh, facility received an award. Uh, see there, and then we've got a couple of mid-year uh, reports from Public Works Department, an update on microsurfacing work that's underway, and then a pretty extensive report from our engineering division. You see a lot of uh, activity on a number of different projects there. Be happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Are there any questions for the city manager? None. Thank you, Dave. Some good stuff in this document. If anyone wants to read it, it's uh, the engineering report is is quite substantial. The only other thing I would point out, and I know Mayor, you and other commissioners are very much involved. Uh, really want to uh, take a, a tip of the hat to, to Megan and all the work that a lot of other uh, city employees and other community members have been involved in. The, 1863 commemoration. I know um, the, 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 the actual day is tomorrow and the, the, the Twitter work and the uh, events over the weekend and things like that. A lot of work has gone into it um, and I think it's been well received. So uh, appreciate their efforts. Yeah, it's been great. As I said, <clears throat> as I told you yesterday, I enjoyed your comments uh, Sunday evening at the commemoration uh, ceremony. It, it was really, really well done. So yeah. thank you. The uh, new exhibit yeah. is great, and uh, the concert was great, with at least the part I heard. I had to go to a birthday party, but uh, I, I really appreciate everyone showing up and honoring the, the, the past, and I think uh, appreciating the people that have moved to Lawrence forward since its early days. So thanks, everybody in the city who's helped with that. And yeah, the other Twitter thing is tomorrow, is that right? Yes. Okay. For those Twitter followers, it'll be interesting. Started tonight. He Twittered right. about five o'clock. We we will we ride. So it's pound QR eighteen sixty three. Very good. You know what that is, Mike? I think so. <laughs> I'm learning. You're teaching me. Very good. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the. Regular agenda items, and I want to remind everybody to silence their cell phones, please, and that there's a time limit for general comments on the regular agenda items of four minutes. At three minutes and 30 seconds, you'll hear this bell, and uh, that will be your indication to wrap up your comments if possible. First item on the regular agenda is to consider a request for a time limit parking in front of 305 East 7th Street. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. In uh, February, city staff received a request from the property owner at three, uh, 305 East 7th Street requesting time on parking in front of their business, indicating that uh, when the library moved over to the Borders building temporarily, that parking started occurring all day long in front of that business that had not been the situation before. In uh, March, at the uh, Traffic Safety Commission meeting on the 18th, there was uh, 
one uh, downtown business owner that uh, appeared and spoke in opposition to the request, indicating that uh, she thought that there was sufficient uh, short-term parking in the area, but there was a shortage of long-term parking in the area. Uh, the Traffic Safety Commission did vote unanimously, eight to zero, to deny the request. And so now it is before you, and I, with that, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Any questions about this agenda item? Mayor, if I could. So traffic safety only considered um, uh, that site that is in front of uh, 307 there? That's, that's correct. it? That's correct. And the parking that's on the east side of that alley that's long-term parking all the way to the next corner there at, no, was it that's Connecticut? Correct. Okay. Any other questions for Dave? Thank you very much. Public comment on regular agenda item one. We have an applicant. Just come on forward and sign in and state your name. Waiting for somebody else. Sure. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I just have a short thing to say. This is my block, and um, uh, we celebrate this business at the end of the block. They seem to have um, a steady, roaring clientele. Um, but they are a small neighborhood business in East Lawrence. They are not part of downtown. They are over um, the line in the neighborhood. And um, the parking garage is going to be done really soon at the library. Is it? end of August that it's going to be done and I think that will relieve some of the pressure on the parking um, the last time I understand you did that did this it was for Jensen's liquor during the football games because they were everybody was blocking their traffic and <coughs> round corner drugs when there was construction next door and Tom Wilcox had elderly customers that he needed to get in this doesn't seem comparable in terms of pressure um, <coughs> I also might mention that the tax office is so popular that during tax time there are people blocking the alley, stacked up two cars out. Um, they're just not as courteous as they could be to their neighbors, so I would assume they'd want to cut some slack to a downtown neighbor that wants to park there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jared Humerkaus the owner of uh, Hume's Tax Service. We also run uh, three businesses out of the office, H&H &H Appraisal Service and Gardner Insurance. Um, like, like stated before, there, there was never a problem in the previous 18 years until the library moved to Borders, um, and it's created a big problem for us. Um, I just would like to be considered, even though I'm two and a half blocks off Mass, now that the library's over there, it's like I am on Mass and would like to have the same opportunity as people down in that area with uh, limited time parking in front of the business. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Judith Dutton and I am a downtown business owner. Um, I spoke against this request when it came before the Traffic Commission on March 18th of this year and assumed that with the unanimous decision to deny the request that the matter, matter was settled. That it has come up again reinforces my experience with the owner and employees of the tax service who seem to believe that their business deserves special um, treatment. I certainly understand that the tax service would want to her parking in front of their business. That would essentially stop anyone who works downtown from parking there and would give them parking primarily for their clients. Their business has at least two private parking spaces next to their building, but it seems that they want those spaces for themselves so they won't be inconvenienced. Um, parking is limited with the library temporary located adjacent to them. And, but that lot has a two hour lot. I mean, it is a two hour lot there and there are frequently places. And in fact, when I drove left work today at about five, there were no, no cars parked on 7th Street in that block at all. I want to give you a 
a history of the, my experience with this business, it's just a short history. In January of last year, I left work. It was a cold night, it was a rainy night, it was dark, and I found a wet piece of paper on my car, uh, and it stated that as of Monday morning, that that space would be restricted to Hume Tax Services clients only. I went into the office, asked who had placed it there, and someone said they had done it. I talked to them and said I understood that parking was tight, for downtown, for all of us. Um, and I knew they weren't used to that, but that it was a city street and that I, I had a right to park there. Two days later, I again parked outside the street, parked on the street in front of their building, and one of the employees came outside, raised his hands in the air, and yelled at me. Um, I was pretty shaken up, went on to work, and at that time decided to call the police and report the incident. They told me that would be recorded, but nothing could be done at that time. The next time I parked in front of the office, I returned to my car several hours later and had a $55 parking ticket on there for parking 13 and a half inches from the curb when the ordinance says 12 inches. They had called a police officer to come out to ticket my car. When he tried to talk them out of ticketing, they insisted that he go ahead and give a ticket because I had broken the law. Um, so I was feeling pretty harassed and anxious at that time, and once again, I drove around the block and called the police. The officer who had ticketed my car came to my home and talked to me about it, asked me what I wanted, and I said all I wanted was to be able to park peacefully wherever I needed to park on a city street. Um, at that time, he went back down to the business, talked to them, told them to you know, leave me alone, and called me after that and said he thought the problem had been settled. Unfortunately, it had not been settled. A week later, I again parked in front of their office. That morning, one of the men came out, pretended to look at his mailbox way before mail time. Um, I locked my car and walked away. When I returned to the car around one o'clock, the same man who had come out when I parked there in the morning came, in and came out again and began watching me try to maneuver out of a tight parking space. After a little bit, I rolled down my window and asked if there was anything he needed. He said oh, he was just watching me. And I waited, and again I said, is there anything I can do for you? He said, I'm just watching you. And when I said, I prefer that you not watch me, he said, oh, I'm just watching the dog across the street and went inside. Um, I drove away, but stopped again a couple of blocks to call the police to say I was ready to file a disorderly conduct complaint against them. This is what the officer had recommended when he had come out to my house if this had not been settled. I was beginning to feel uncomfortable and not knowing what would happen yet next. I was both anxious and angry about continuing to be harassed for simply parking on a city street. Um, on February 15th, Officer Mark Lyson came to my house, picked me up in a patrol car and took me down so I could identify the man who was continuing to harass me and he did order, he did issue a ticket for disorderly conduct at that time. During this time, I also spoke with Mayor Shum, who told me that six months earlier, he had been asked by Hume Tax Service not to park in front of their building. And while he said he would agree to do that, he said it was a city street. Um, this behavior is the reason I'm less surprised than I might otherwise be, that they're, they're here again appealing the unanimous decision of the Traffic Commission, even though they did not show up for the meeting the night that this was, was on the agenda. Um, so that's my personal story with this business, but it's not the primary reason I oppose the granting of the two-hour parking. Uh, we all know that parking is tight downtown, and it's very difficult for the, the owners and those who shop downtown, and that's obviously being addressed at this point with the parking garage. Um, I'm a psychotherapist in private practice, and I would love for my clients and for myself to have parking right outside my door. My clients have to pay a parking meter or park in a two-hour lot, which is just as close as the tax service is to a two-hour lot. Um, for myself, I have to walk a couple of blocks, at least, to find a parking place. Um, and so again, I, I understand that they would want this, but I, it sounds to me like they're asking for special privileges at this point. This will be alleviated soon, and what this does is just, if, if it's granted, it will just allow them essentially private parking for their clients and they will still have their private parking. Um, so to, I'm asking once again that this request be denied. Um, to grant it would inconvenience even more of the many other downtown business owners who are having to look for places to park and who don't have their own private parking. And as a community, I believe that we work together and that none of us 
deserves special treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any additional public comment? Okay. Back to commission. Anybody uh, have any questions for staff or related to the tra traffic safety commission's comments? Just one question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, David, did, so what was requested was two hour mark the tire kind of uh, parking for the two hour? Yes, I believe that's correct. Right, okay. it's time limit parking there so that people have to move in and move out. And we don't do that anywhere else in uh, town that I'm aware of other than, you know, on this temporary basis? I think that's correct. There may be some zones, but I'd have to look at the city code to confirm that. Okay. Was there any consideration given to metered parking along there? No one brought up metered parking, but that's, you know, that's, there's metered parking, you know, within a half a block of this location, so. Uh, but traffic safety usually doesn't deal with meters themselves time limit and that type of thing they do but the um, meter requests usually don't go to the traffic safety okay that's something that that we handle it at this board right yes okay um, I mean when I when I was down there this afternoon and, and uh, uh, Judith I, I was there at I think three o'clock uh, so I had a meeting down here and there had been there was one car that you know had been there since eight o'clock this morning I'd gone by earlier so you know, I, I know that there was, you know, at least one vehicle that didn't turn over all day, but uh, um, I, I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, I understand the Traffic Safety Commi uh, Commission and, 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 and not hearing, I guess, from uh, uh, both sides of this when they heard it back in uh, earlier this year, but uh, I wonder if it's something that we ought to consider a metered parking along in there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> since I was mentioned in the statements. Uh, I think I know a little bit more about this than was presented. First of all, as I recall at the time where I was asked not to park in front of the place, which I agreed to, I just parked further on down the block. It was during their tax season, and I guess the tax season is anywhere from December 31st to April 15th, which is pretty busy. And I understand that, and I think KT Walsh even indicated that at times there's lots of traffic there. So you're, you're talking about a, a, a three or so month duration um, where they have a lot of traffic and that's good. I'm glad they're business as well. Uh, we're real close to opening up this parking garage within uh, a couple weeks, I'm thinking. And I would rather see us uh, wait, if we're gonna do something, let's wait and see what effect the parking garage has on this situation and maybe it, go, it goes away. The other thing you have to remember is if you put some kind of parking control device there, then you're gonna to have to bring your parking control personnel all the way down there to monitor it, which for, I don't know if there's two spaces there or three, but either for two meters or three meters or three spaces for a two hour lot, it's, it's, a, it's not, not very cost effective, I wouldn't think. So my, my inclination would be that since it's out of tax season and since we're almost very close uh, seeing what opportunities are going to exist in the new 325 space parking garage that we wait and not do anything right now and concur with uh, the uh, traffic and safety committee. Okay. One of the things that was mentioned, I'm sorry, one of the things that was mentioned was that there was available parking two hour within uh, half a block. Is that, is there typically availability there? Do we know? That's in the uh, in the borders borders lot. That's all two hour parking in that entire lot there. I I don't know how often it's available because um, we don't control that under our division. But that's where the the uh, two hour parking is available within a half a block of this business. But it's likely during the day that there is some availability there. I would think so. Okay. I drove by there earlier today, and I, I couldn't help but, um, but I couldn't help but notice that there's there's five off street parking spots behind, and then um, I don't know I was just trying to problem solve here, and, and 
you know, understanding the, the need to mitigate traffic in front of the business and maybe figuring out an alternative solution. And, and I may want to suggest to the business owners that um, Pastor Paul Wynn, that, that pastor is the first, first temple church of God in Christ, something like that, uh, right there at 7th in Connecticut, to, to perhaps utilize his spaces during busier times. Um, that it wouldn't become a parking lot, but if we're talking about two spaces, my inclination is, I mean, I parked there during the campaign. It was on a non-church night and I was walking in East Lawrence and it wasn't a sign telling me that I couldn't, but I, I, I can't imagine having an issue with that as long as it doesn't interfere with their programs. But, but I've got, you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement with Bob here that, that, you know, let's see what the library does and, and, uh, I think there's other solutions rather than putting time limit enforcement or meters here that would be more appropriate um, in this situation. Okay. Let me suggest rather than concurring with traffic safety, uh, why don't we table this item until after the uh, uh, garage opens up as suggested by uh, Commissioner Shum and, and, and look at it again in 60 days. Yes. You, you might days. want to wait till 90 days. 90 days after the garage opens so people yeah, get well, used to it. Yeah, yeah whatever. Well, can I just, I mean, that's a, that's a good suggestion, but I, I guess I'm more along the lines of, I think there are some better solutions than, you know, than, than waiting for that, that, um, you know, because the, the parking garage, sure, will release some of the pressure, but it really won't happen until the library sure. leaves yeah. borders. Um, but I just think that there are some alternative things that maybe the business owners could consider. Um, and, and I'm, I'm especially bothered by, by how rudely, uh, Ms. Dutton was treated. Um, so, so, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for that, uh, to, to table it. I mean, I, you know, I don't think it's going to do any good to bring it back in 90 days because unless the library is complete, it's really, that's true. There'd be a lot of parking that's still at borders. That lot is pretty full these days so, until the library well, is gone. Uh, if you want a motion, I make a motion to deny the request. Okay. Did you want to say something? Second. Okay. Uh, okay, we have a motion to deny the request for time li limit parking in front of 305 East 7th Street by Commissioner Shum. Ask him again. He, he wanted to say something. I know. Right? I, mean, I asked him, but he sat down. Did you want to speak? My name is Isaac Gardner, Lawrence, Kansas. Unlike what Mr. Shum said, it's not just a Humes tax from December 31st to April 15th. I'm the owner of Gardner Insurance that's in that same office. So I have clients coming in every day, all day, that same spot. So it's not just a three month window that you guys were talking about. No. So you, it's busier yes. all the time? Yes, there's, there's a full time insurance agency there, okay. which I meet with clients pretty regularly. Well, okay. what I was referring to was at that period of time, it was maxed out. That was the, that window is the maxed out time when, when there's the most amount of action. So I didn't mean to preclude there's not any business the rest of the year. So thank you. Okay. Um, so there's a motion on the table by um, Commissioner Shum and seconded by Commissioner Reardon to, den uh, to affirm the denial um, of denying the request. Uh, so unless there's further comment on that, um, I would vote on that. Is there, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Okay, the motion passes 4-1 with Commissioner Amix dissenting. The next item on the agenda is consider approving the rezoning um, of approximately 5.09 acres of land from IG General District to IL Limited industrial district. Hi. Good evening. <clears throat> Sheila Stogsdale, planning staff. We have just a few slides for you tonight um, to describe this rezoning request and what the planning commission's discussion was. Um, the property is, all of you are very much aware, I'm sure, is um, at the corner of East Hills Drive and uh, K-10. And it is five acres, <clears throat> and 
um, has been zoned IG uh, since the business park was first developed in the early 80s. Um, the factors that the Planning Commission considered in looking at the rezoning is that when you go from IG to IL, you are still keeping the property in the industrial inventory. Um, the fact that this property does, while it's five acres, it has um, some pretty substantial um, challenges. There's about 40 feet of fall from uh, west to east, from east to west, um, which will certainly affect the size and, um, and location of any building that would happen on this site and the fact that it has been vacant for 25 years. Um, the applicant uh, proactively restricted 21 uses that are allowed in the IL district. Some of those were actually um, permitted in the IG district as well. Um, and then the code um, eliminates four additional um, uses that are the more intense industrial uses, the truck stop and um, storage of explosives, um, mining and intensive industrial. So what we uh, focused on with our analysis was really the additional uses that rezoning to IL would provide to this property so that we can weigh um, what you have on this site. And um, this slide shows you those additional uses. Um, it provides a wider range for marketing the property, um, including having some of those financial and um, commercial uses. We thought this would be beneficial to the industrial parks um, in terms of being able to open it up and have some business service uses um, available there. We did highlight the three uses, fast order food drive-in, uh, food and beverage, and retail sales general, um, to specifically ask the Planning Commission to discuss because we felt like those were the more intensive of the commercial uses that might not strictly be um, more of a park service kind of use. Um, so their discussion in the minutes really focused on those issues, whether the site should be available for business park services or pulling um, traffic right off of the highway, um, looking at the traffic issues that are associated with that because of the intersection um, issues that you all have been um, discussing for many years and the reason that we put a traffic signal at O'Connell so that we could get most of that traffic moving that direction to get into the parks. Um, and also just the um, gateway aspects of um, this location right at the entrance to the business park. Um, after that discussion, you do have a recommendation for approval um, with a five to one vote, and it is including the restrictions that the applicant um, originally proposed and does not restrict any of the other uses that staff had asked them to discuss. And so you have this recommendation um, if you choose to act on it and also adopt Ordinance 8891 on first reading. Okay. Yes. Uh, Sheila, in our packet mm -hmm. of materials, there's, a, I guess it's referred to as a map, and it has a subject area, but it has two lots on either side of it that are designated as A and there's... Mm -hmm. What, the, what is that? Those are both um, outside of the city limits, so they're zoned ag. Oh, is that agriculture? Um, and they both happen to be cemeteries. Um, this one was uh, the pocket in the farmland um, plat, and then this one has, has always just been a pocket in the East Hills plat. Hmm. Got stuff planted there, right? <laughs> I don't know. Did you say cemeteries? Yeah. Yes. Are there people buried there? Yes. In both places? As I yes. said, That's I don't do know. <laughs> that Franklin Cemetery from a million years ago? I think 
think they're that's still is there. Thank you. Sheila, there was a fair amount of discussion um, about safety coming in. Mm -hmm. and I think one of the reasons that um, the Planning Commission decided that a fast food and some place that had sold gasoline and food would generate about the same amount of trips. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the discussion with that, my understanding is that the staff and, and the Planning Commission thought that even though there was increased traffic there because of the signalization of that, that that would be not a big safety issue. We wouldn't have to worry about that or... How, how you were there, how, how mm -hmm. would you summarize that? There was discussion about why didn't you restrict gas and fuel if you're suggesting drive-in food. That was part of the discussion. And, and the reasoning was that gas and fuel is allowed today in the IG district. And so we, we did our analysis really looking at what were the expanded uses, not looking at trying to further restrict uses that you know the applicant wasn't suggesting that he give up that are today um, the issue on the safety um, the traffic signal is not at this intersection you know the traffic signal is at O'Connell and our intention or our hope is that when farmland um, street connectivity to East Hills is available that the folks that have difficulty getting in and out of East Hills because of the traffic um, safety issues at, at this intersection here will be able to <coughs> utilize O'Connell and drive through farmland to get to East Hills um, you know, and avoid this intersection. Um, so our discussion was should we add additional uses that might tend to pull that traffic off the highway as opposed to uses that might serve the park users during the day or on their way home or that. And um, the commission also, I think, seems satisfied with the fact that at any point when there's a, a project proposed, there would be a site plan which would then go through a review process with KDOT and have the opportunity to really look at a specific, you know, traffic analysis at that point. Yes. Sheila, on those 5.09 acres uh, and looking at that top topography, there's going to have to be an, either an awful lot of fill or uh, some detention, serious detention on there somewhere. How much, how much, I don't know, how many acres of that property can really be developed uh, is really developable ground and how much more than the 50,000 square feet of gross area are we talking about here? Any idea? Uh, I mean, you, the slope of that yeah. is incredible. Huh. The likelihood, I think, would be that you would have a, a, a multi, you know, a two-story building where you could have access, you know, from two different sides, um, you know, but... Okay. You're going to have to have, you know, a series of parking lots and that. Um, yes, we so we don't anticipate it being necessarily a large building, but you could have, you know, a multi-tenant building and maybe a, you know, a separate building, pad site kind of building. Okay. Definitely a challenge. Any other questions for Sheila? Very good, thank you. Uh, Randy Larkin, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Just to remind the commission that this is a rezoning matter, so you're sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity. So we probably, before we hear public comment, uh, disclose ex parte contacts so that everyone has the same information to base their decision. And, and people would have an opportunity to respond to anything that came outside of the hearing. Okay, great. Thanks, Randy. Commissioner Farmer, have you any ex parte conversations? I have not. Mike? Well, I think I talked to Steve Glass. Uh, I think he asked me if I had any questions, but I, I didn't, so. Yeah, I didn't have any ex parte conversations other than discussion at the 
uh, agenda meeting. I guess we uh, talked a little yeah. bit about it within within staff, but that's it. Nothing. First time I've seen it is tonight. I have nothing to report. Okay. Very good. That covers our ex parte communications regarding this matter. Is there any public comment on this? Someone left the glasses up here. <laughs> Sheila. Probably aren't strong enough for me to use. Mayor and Commissioners, uh, my name is Steve Glass. I am one of the uh, owners of uh, GHB Investors, and with me is Daryl Bean, who's another uh, the, one of the investors, and H couldn't be here tonight. Um, let me just try and address two or three issues. I don't, I'm not going to try and go through the whole thing. I think the information you have and Sheila's presentation have given you a uh, a pretty good uh, view of, of what we're requesting. The, the first thing I want to mention is that we've owned this 25 years. And we bought it with the intent of selling it or developing it. And 25 years later, that's still our intent. But probably, uh, given our advancing ages, we're probably looking more at selling than, than we are developing. Uh, but we come to the conclusion that we're never going to be able to sell it to someone to use, for example, for a 50,000 square foot industrial type building. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is the terrain. And, and the second is that there are more restrictive restrictions on lots in East Hills adjacent to the highway than there are on other lots in East Hills. For example, outside storage is more limited on, on this lot than, than it would be on others. So we just don't see uh, any significant industrial enterprise wanting to locate there. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, before submitting this to the city, I met with the uh, what's now called the Economic Development Corporation of Lawrence, which is the old Douglas County Development Inc. Uh, entity, which is an offshoot of the chamber. And they approved uh, uh, the, what we were proposing to do here. Uh, secondly, the uh, intersection issues, uh, I understand having owned the property on the other side of the highway and and dealt with getting concrete trucks and dump trucks and various other vehicles on and off the highway in a safe fashion. Uh, I understand the concern, but I think there are three mitigating, mitigating uh, factors that uh, have developed in recent years uh, or will be developing uh, in the case of one of them. First is KDOT after numerous meetings with the businesses in East Hills and our business uh, on, on the south side uh, put in the flashing yellow lights that flash when a vehicle approaches either on East Hills Drive or comes out from the ready mix concrete plant. That gives the oncoming traffic eastbound and westbound uh, an indication that there is potential traffic conflict there. I think that's worked reasonably well. Uh, I'm not out there all the time uh, anymore since I've retired, but uh, uh, I certainly haven't read in the paper about the volume of accidents that were occurring there, say, 10, 12 years ago. The second is the installation of the traffic signals at 23rd and O'Connell has created, uh, has, has helped the situation for eastbound traffic because it stops that traffic, creates a break in the traffic, which gives people, whether they're coming from the south or coming from the north, the opportunity to get into the eastbound lane, or in the case of the traffic on the south, to also get into the, uh, to the westbound lane without having to dodge cars or trucks while doing that. Uh, and I think that will only, that impact will only increase 
when the connection is made to farmland because the, uh, I, I believe, I guess David's gone now, but I believe that signal there will be controlled by the traffic demand from the side streets. Chuck's <coughs> shaking his head, correct? And uh, so I think there will be quite a few interruptions as farmland develops and as the, the uh, people in East Hills use that intersection. And finally, and, I, and maybe the most major issue is that uh, when the South Lawrence traffic way is completed and they're taking bids on that next month, so it's getting closer and closer, uh, I would guess at least half the traffic will no longer be coming down 23rd Street. So you're going to have a significant reduction in traffic, both east and westbound, just because people will be choosing to use the South Lawrence traffic way and that interchange will be to the east of this location. So I, I think those three factors all uh, mitigate the, uh, the traffic concerns. Uh, with that, why don't I stop and see if you have any questions that I can address. Any questions for Steve? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Additional public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll back to the commission on this. Commissioners, do you have any questions to staff before we uh, make a decision on this or have any comments? I think the, uh, my personal opinion is I think that the Planning Commission minutes are a little confusing for those of us who weren't there in that I think the, there's some, there was some discussion about what would and would not be allowed relative to fast food restaurants. So that seems, seems to me the, the major discussion, and I don't know if any of you have any comments or questions about that, but I think they did a pretty good job coming to a reasonable conclusion on what should and should not be allowed there. So just wanted to... I, I would agree. I thought they did a pretty good job of discussing this. It was a little confusing because they went back and forth. But I think the final thoughts were that, you know, since since this was able to, uh, some of the things that are going to be there now, such as uh, a building uh, for a gas station, would be similar to uh, a fast food. And you probably have the same number of people coming in that wouldn't wouldn't cause any problems with safety for the public or increase safety problems. Um, I think we need to try to encourage development and it hasn't developed for 25 years. I know um, my lot is about 20 degrees and it drops about 80 feet uh, in um, much less space than this. So it's very difficult to develop and very expensive. Um, so I think to encourage some development here would be a good idea. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mayor, I think I think the Planning Commission did a pretty thorough job of looking at, you know, the number of uses that would be allowed and not be allowed. I um, appreciate the work that the applicant did in, in trying to come to a reasonable recommendation. Also, our staff um, uh, and their thorough job of uh, uh, going through and making a positive recommendation here. Sometimes you have to make a change in zoning that's going to help a piece of property be able to develop, and I think if that's what they've done, Taking into consideration, um, you know, a number of the things that uh, Mr. Glass brought up about how hard it is to uh, develop in these hills, especially out uh, at the K-10 highway side. I know that those, um, I was probably involved um, in putting some of those limitations on there. So um, I think they were still a reasonable approach, but, you know, sometimes they're a little bit tough. But um, I think that uh, it's good. One of the things that, that I did think is I was wondering how much of uh, the, the development here uh, may come, or you know, the business um, um, and supporting these businesses would come from the business park itself versus, you know, highway traffic that would pull in and out. No, but that's for another deal. Uh, but I, I do think it is a positive deal that uh, the Planning Commission did. I think the uses are reasonable and I think we should approve. Okay, very good. Jimmy, I feel the same way. I mean, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, I've got some friends that work 
out at East Hills Business Park and, you know, it's a task for them in a 30 minute lunch to drive into town. Yeah. Um, and so to have something there, even though, you know, fast food wouldn't be ideal as opposed to, you know, a place where you can get something a little healthier, but um, that's not our call to make, to, to regulate decisions that people make. So um, 25 years, we had the same, we didn't, uh, I wasn't a part of this, but, but the commission had the same discussion about Ninth and New Hampshire. You know, how, how long do we let that sit vacant? And um, so, so I think this is a good thing for us to do. Okay. Um, any I move we approve ordinance number 8891. There's a motion. Second. Motion by Commissioner Shum, second by Vice Mayor Amix. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Next item on the agenda is to consider authorizing the mayor to sign a cooperation agreement with the Kansas Department of Transportation and Douglas County for the K-10 Bob Billings Parkway Interchange. talked about this project briefly before um, the interchange at the intersection of K-10 and Bob Billings Parkway. KDOT is planning on putting that out for bid next spring. Um, they are currently um, working on finalizing the plans. They've acquired most of the right-of-way. talked to them a little bit about some of the right-of-way um, today. Um, N-1500 Road um, will no longer access K-10. It will go ahead and tie into George Williams Way. Um, GL Inc. will be providing right of way um, in this curvilinear alignment. The existing right of way, we will, when the road project is done, we will vacate back to Jack Gomnitz. Um, <clears throat> tonight, the commission is being asked to consider the cooperation agreement between the city, the state, and Douglas County. Um, Douglas County will act on it tomorrow night. It's on their agenda. Um, basically, the agreement says um, that. There's a couple, three things. Um, number one, we'll be taking care of the uh, rec path. The rec path will uh, go under. There will be an underpass, or kind of similar to 6th Street, uh, but it will also tie into Bob Billings Parkway as well, um, above ground. Um, we're also agreeing the, Bre the Bright Halps have a tract of land that sits over by Lake Point Drive. Um, they have some farm equipment that they used to run down 1500 Road, and then they access K-10. With that being closed um, and them having to access city streets, um, they requested an access onto Lake Point Drive. Um, the city will build that and KDOT will reimburse the city for that. That's in this agreement. Um, we also have a piece of right of way that the state needs, and this one's a little harder to see. <clears throat> but essentially, we own this tract right here off the interchange area, and this red area, if you can see it. It's in your agenda packet, but the state needs that to facilitate or to complete the exit ramps and the rec path as well. So they're asking us to donate that, which is contained within the city-state agreement. Um, <clears throat> the final thing is uh, is the financial contribution. The city has is agreeing to contribute a million dollars in 2015 to this project. The county, 528000 um, the total cost of the project estimated at uh, 17.2 million. Um, this was discussed as part of our Highway 40 turnback agreement um, that included several other projects as well. Um, I can answer any questions if the commission has any. Any questions for Chuck? Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mike. Dave. Yeah, Dave. Just quickly uh, reminder we have engaged BG, BG consultants to do the design work for the traffic signal at Bob Billings Parkway and George Williams Way it's just a reminder of where that is so when that's design is finished this project will probably be getting ready to to bid we'll probably bid it separately but we'll be paying for that that traffic signal and pre, under previously authorized debt obligation the other thing is is that this always brings up the issue of the city owned property there it's my recommendation that we wait until uh, the final uh, opening of this interchange, in my opinion, the value of that property will then be probably at its highest. Um, it will, uh, we may want to then uh, consider selling it. We'll see if we don't have a public city use for it. Obviously, we're getting a little bit of a city use or public use in regards to the, uh, the pathway here. A, con a contractor may want to talk to us about it being a, 
a lay down area for the for the construction as well but I just want to keep that in mind somebody may say well why do we have that well we don't we don't really have a, a city use in, in mind we might might come up with a city use but uh, it really doesn't fit doesn't fit the need for example for a police facility it's not large enough um, so anyway wanted to just not I don't want to have too much of a digression on your main issue here but wanted to point that out because we don't really talk too much about that thank you appreciate that is that is that outlined in the packet material well it is you, you can Sorry. see it um, it's essentially this track here you see where it says city of Lawrence let's see how do I do it? let's see on this one? Can you get the packet where it shows the red by Billy? It also shows the track line, the very light. I don't know if that helps anything, oh, Commissioner. It's kind of, mine's kind of blurry. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. How many, how many acres is that that we own, approximately? I think it's like six or seven. We're, 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 they're taking just a little bit of the property, but you know, you're going to, a developer is probably going to have to dedicate some of it just to develop on it anyway. So. Does it, does it doesn't front on any road, does it? Yeah, yeah. Right it now. will. Only, it's only adjacent to Bob Billings Way, right? Yep. Right. Yeah, the new Bob Billings. Extended. Okay, is there any public comment on this item? Just, just you. Just me. Okay. Mr. Mayor, Hi. commissioners. My name is Julie Hack. I live at 4300 Quail Point Terrace. Uh, looking at the agenda item, I understand that I'm not quite on the right area, but I'd like to, you to listen to me for a few minutes anyway, and it won't be more than four. I have some observations and a question, if I may. Um, I got in my car this morning and drove the four mile approximately distance between Iowa Street and the barricades on at the end of Bob Billings Parkway. <clears throat> and I counted 60 exits and entrances off of Bob Billings Parkway in that four mile area. Lots of them, uh, including churches, residences, businesses, and uh, university-owned property, uh, have other access to roads other than Bob Billings Parkway, but there are a few that are landlocked properties, is what I would call them. They include where I live in Quail Point, um, El Dorado Drive, Medina, and Alvamar Drive are all in the same situation. You go in and you come out onto Bob Billings Parkway. I cannot see that increased traffic on that road is going to get any better, it will only get worse. So my question to you is, acknowledging that there's going to be a stoplight at George Williams Way, which I think is wonderful. There are, I hope that you have in plan other traffic controlling methods that will slow down the additional traffic that comes along there. And my, uh, the other question is, are there these plans in place, sir? Uh, and if so, will they be implemented by the time the traffic way uh, is open. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Please. Mrs. Hacks, uh, questions are good. Um, we do not have plans um, in place for all of the traffic issues. Um, we are in the process of, of looking at it. Um, we will be responding to some of the traffic issues as, as they occur. We do have some maintenance of this area planned for 2014 along Bob Billings Parkway. 
So as we do that maintenance, we'll be looking at some of those, um, some of those items. It is a, it's a long stretch of road. Um, each area probably is going to need some level of, uh, of, of, of thought. Some of it probably won't need any changes uh, to it. But um, we, you, you already are familiar with the work that we're doing as far as maintenance is concerned. Um, but we'll, we'll, we're going to be looking at, we've had some comments from uh, uh, some of the, the other property owners uh, along the stretch, and we'll continue to, to look at it. But we don't have any specific plans, nor do we have any funding for any specific plans along that. Um, a growing community is going to have more traffic, and that's what we will see on Bob Billings Parkway is, is more traffic with the completion of this interchange in, in a couple of years. So just the one, so right now the answer to her question is? We're aware of the issue, but we don't have, we have neither plans nor funding uh, outside of some of the maintenance work. Okay. Uh, we have identified a traffic signal at George Williams Way. We're going to be looking at, at other options, but we also, it's, a, it's an arterial street and it is designed to uh, move uh, people from uh, one part of the city to another part of the city. I don't know, Chuck, you can add. Some of our maintenance projects, like on Bob Billings between Castled and um, Iowa, um, you'll notice that we did take out and put turn lanes in yeah. to get people out of the you know moving traffic so they can make a safe uh, left turn. Turn lanes, yeah, I thought that you turn. Um, so as we continue to work that way, we are aware that you know with more traffic, we're going to have to uh, put in these left turn lanes so people can get um, off the road safely and have have a safe place to turn from. Um, David Woosley is also, they had a public meeting um, over a year ago. Um, we had a lot of questions, the same questions Ms. Hack um, had brought up, you know, about the same areas. Um, and David Woosley is currently looking right now um, all the way from George Williams Way to Iowa at that whole corridor, um, what we may need or may not need um, to do as far as traffic. So um, we don't have the answers yet, but Dave's looking at them. We're hoping to get those probably by the end of this year and then have that discussion with the community and the commission as well. Um, there may be some more signals warranted. There may not be, um, but we are aware of it and we are trying to take the precautions or make the proper design um, changes as we, as we rebuild 15th or Bob Billings as we have done. Chuck, along, uh, along at looking at those things, do we ever do like um, um, a median speed study of our arterial roadways? I mean, I understand and I appreciate the comment by the city manager that <coughs> these roads are, are designed to carry, right. you know, large amounts of traffic and, and get them, you know, to and from conveniently. But do we ever look at what those median speeds are? Yes. And are they going up from time to time? And Th That's part of what David's looking at. Okay. Um, the speeds right now, current speeds, because okay. on that section from Wakarusa to the church or George Williams Way, it's pretty wide open, and, and we've heard there's been some pretty high speeds, and I think David's got some information on that. So he's looking at traffic, um, the development in the area, and um, the, the projected traffic volumes. Um, you know, when, they, when the intersection opens up, I think they're expecting at least 5,000 more when it opens, and it will increase from there. Well, that that was the discussion we had several weeks ago when we looked at the stoplight at George Williams Way and Bob Billings and the that increased traffic and and you know you have that increased traffic and right. now you, we talk about wide open and increased uh, speeds uh, you know I think you know as commission being aware of those things and maybe there's things that we can do to address it. Yep, we're tr we're trying to we'd like to at least have the recommendations to you before they open it up and then we'll have to figure out how to fund any improvements that are needed. Chuck, I think Julie has some very bona fide concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the concerns, uh, and, and I think as far as the average speed, I can tell you I travel this two days a week, and when I'm going 45 or maybe slightly over that, people are passing me at 10 to 15 miles more on a consistent basis. So um, yep. I think that is uh, in a high speed area, much higher than its, its signal, or it's what's is registered for but the other thing is i think there'll be certain times of year uh like around now where the number of people coming through that will be that we have to take into consideration if there are temporary things we can do 
And on game days uh, and game nights for football and basketball, there'll be a tremendous increase of that and safety issues I worry about. And I think those are things that we should um, be in, in, in concert with the, with the uh, people who live along there and use that, can go in and out and can only go in and out there because they're landlocked. I think those are important things that we ought to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, there's obviously nothing we can do today, but I think except to say that these are concerns and I think they're legitimate concerns and we should continue to look at them and see if they are um, a problem as we go along. Yep. Okay. What, what year does this get constructed in? Do we know that? And they're going to bid it next spring in 2014, and it's to be open prior to or in conjunction with the SLT being completed. So Just 2015? 2015, 2016, yeah. Additional public comment? Okay. Well, I think uh, if, if we if we picked a street to extend to the SLT, fortunately there aren't as many curb cuts and entries on this road as we have on some of the other streets that go across town. I think it was fortunate that um, I was doing the same thing as Julie. I was kind of kind of counting how many homes had access along 15th Street now, Bob Billings Parkway, and then as we go west, further of Wakarusa. And um, there aren't near as many on that street as we have on a lot of the other ones. So it's it, at least we picked a good street to extend. What are you laughing at? I was, I was thinking of a way to slow the traffic down, and I say this completely tongue in cheek, so Chad, don't write about this, but Drone, drones that, with radar that always, guns. By the way, that, always, <laughs> that would be. That always <laughs> works for you. Would probably, yeah. 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 Just kidding. It doesn't uh, work very well. Yeah. So. Probably so so drones are is your answer, huh? Yeah. Okay. So anyway. Uh, drone patrol. Wow. All right. Enough of that drone. So anyway, I think I think we've got. We, we, we got, we're fortunate and we have this opportunity and we also need to embrace the, the need for proper control and the flow of traffic. And I heard two commissioners mentioning uh, radar and police officers. So that's one way to, to encourage people to slow down. But I think if we engineer these roads properly and we put in the proper um, traffic con control devices, we should, we should, this should be an effective uh, route for us to move people from east to west and vice versa. One yes, thing it will do is it'll take a lot of pressure off the north-south activity in front of Langston Hughes School, and that is a major route out right now where you go down Bob Billings West and then turn and go north to get out to 6th and out to K-10. So I think that's a plus for the, the, the addition. You just traffic on 6th Street, too. Yes. Yeah. And, Julie, I, I uh, appreciate what you have to say because I live on St. Andrews, so I'm out there turning with, with you and everyone else that lives out there. Okay. I think we should try to find a way to, you know, make it safer to turn on and off because if you're if you're turning left onto Bob Billings Parkway from Alvamar Drive, I mean that's a and I've made that turn several times and it's kind of nerve wracking. Yeah. You know, cars coming down off the hill and so I don't know what we can do, Chuck, to you know So hold us accountable, Julie. She will. She's my neighbor. Uh-oh. I've got him held hostage. And appropriately so. All right. Okay. Let's, let's do something here. So do we have a motion uh, to discuss and or approve or authorize the mayor to sign this cooperation agreement? So moved. Second. Motion by Vice Mayor Amick, second by Commissioner Shum. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. And the next item on the agenda is to uh, receive a presentation from the city auditor regarding city-county cooperation. So how do I get this? Whoops. Uh, I can, I guess, start talking. Good evening. Mike Glinsky, City Auditor. How do I get this thing off? <laughs> From beginning. There. Thank you. 
it should come up any minute then. There we go. Um, so I'll present tonight this uh, performance audit related to uh, city and county cooperation. Uh, the project had two objectives. They were basically to try to identify as many of these examples where the city and the county are cooperating as I could, and then pull a sample of those and match them up against some, uh, I guess what I've called good practices from literature. Um, I identified quite a lot of these, uh, and they cover a, a really broad range of services. The slide here lists just some examples to give you a, a sense of the, the range. Everything from some fairly small uh, maintenance of baseball diamonds and use of baseball diamonds up to um, what I have on here, you know, emergency communications, capital improvements, some really big major, major services. We also have some of what, what I would call handshake agreements. These are areas where the city and the county are systematically cooperating, but the agreement is not um, written. It's a kind of handshake agreement. Um, this covers uh, some of the examples. I'm sure there are more of these than we're aware of, and some of them are, are probably really minor. Um, handshake agreements aren't necessarily a problem. Uh, you don't want to have to make everything incredibly formal, but in some cases you want to formalize probably some of these handshake agreements. I thought it was interesting that the cooperation that I could identify seems to have increased fairly sh sharply in recent years. In terms, this is just the number of areas where the city and the county are cooperating. Um, the really large cooperation happened often earlier. The construction of the law enforcement center, which was, I think, this, one of the agreements in 71, uh, and the EMS system, which was, I want to say, 95, 96, something like that. But Overall, the number seems to be increasing recently. So I put together a list of uh, good practices for these sort of um, agreements in city and county cooperation. There's a fair amount of literature out there in public administration on, uh, on what, how to cooperate, how interlocal uh, cooperation should take place. It basically boils down to four themes. That is defining the service, um, figuring out how the funding or resources are going to be shared and the approach to that, um, designing some administrative approaches, things like uh, if there's going to be purchasing, is it the city's purchasing policies or the county's purchasing policies we're going to follow, things like that, um, how the money will, will actually be transferred or the resources were transferred, things like that. And finally, establishing mechanisms to oversee the, uh, the services. Um, to some extent, when it's a cooperative service, there's a, it's not directly accountable to either governing body. It's sort of accountable, the accountability is a little bit spread. And so this establishing uh, monitoring mechanisms can be um, especially important. So then I pulled, I pulled just five agreements and matched them up against these good practices. Um, I picked agreements that I thought covered both the range of time that, that I looked at, as well as tried to get at different kinds of services. Um, this shows, shows the five. There wasn't any particular, I didn't want to look at anything really small. I didn't look at the you know, maintenance of Broken Arrow Park, which we share but I also wanted to cover kind of a range of services. And there were gaps, um, as you do any of these kind of projects and you look at, I call them good practices, but maybe we should call them best practices, um, you'll find gaps. Uh, this is a little bit of a summary of those kind of gaps. There were, there were things that we could have done better pretty much in every area and, and every agreement. Um, I, th I think that the, if I got the slide right here, the, um, the issue with these gaps, I think, is because we don't really have a consistent method for, for how we put these agreements together. Uh, part of that is that it's been happening over a long period of time, but part of it is that we just haven't seen the sort of common approaches, and we, we tend, I think, to pre approach things as a, as a one of occurrence. And there are, however, some really overlapping um, kind of themes that we ought to be looking at. Um, I've got a slide here that talks about sort of 
one of the reasons we need to look at these kind of systematic approaches. And uh, the, one of the best practices is to talk about how you're going to make that transfer of, of, a, of a payment. Um, and in one of the agreements I looked at, we didn't, we didn't do that. And uh, the county had committed um, a little over $1.2 million to fund their new fire station. And for reasons it's a little hard to figure out, that transfer never happened. Now, in 2012, it, we became aware of it, or the county became aware of it, or, or something happened, and we sort of were given credit for that in a different agreement. But that's a, something sort of falling through the cracks. And, uh, and I think we need to strengthen our processes to try to reduce the chances of that sort of issue. Um, I didn't want to s stop with just something that seemed like it wasn't, wasn't maybe the best. Um, so I looked at an agreement where we did, I think, a pretty good job in the agreement of establishing a monitoring mechanism to try to address accountability. And that's a very recent agreement for funding senior services. Um, it's agreement with the Douglas County Senior Services, DCSS, um, where both the city and the county are providing funding. Uh, the agreement makes it reasonably clear what the executive director's responsibilities are and it requires regular reporting to, um, to you guys, uh, quarterly and annual reporting. So that's a, that's a process that's really pretty strong, I think, and in included in one of the agreements. Um, I made just two recommendations. One of those is that we should, we should allow um, for those informal handshake agreements. We don't want to say that the city and the county can only cooperate when it goes through a long, complicated process. But there ought to be some kind of guidelines for when uh, staff ought to say, let's take a step back and try to formalize this. Uh, and the other one is to develop sort of general guidelines on the uh, a consistent method, I think is what I've called it, for entering into these kind of cooperative agreements. Um, I want to make it clear that a consistent method doesn't mean that every agreement's the same. The agreements still need to be tailored to the particulars of the service, and they would vary with the type of service and the, um, you know, the sort of importance and the longevity of, of a process. Um, that's it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I say here that the report is online. Um, I didn't get around to uploading it today. I'll do that first thing in the morning. It's available on the commission agenda, though. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from Michael? All right, anybody know? Dave told me his hand. Dave was looking at you. I've you had, I had some comments at the appropriate time. Do you? Time. Please, I, I appreciate that. Um, I did provide a response to Michael's review, and I think it's, I think it's helpful. And um, I, I do think that um, a good checklist as we go into these uh, agreements to ensure that we're, we're capturing some of the basics are are important. Um, I, we have gotten uh, good marks as far as our city county cooperation, and it primarily is cooperation with the county. We cooperate with the school district and other entities um, as well. Uh, University of Kansas, obviously, rural water districts, a number of other entities, but primarily with Douglas County. We, we've gotten good good marks on that. What, what I hope is is that uh, Michael's report is a, it's a good, good report for its items, but I hope it doesn't end the discussion of uh, increased cooperation. You all have heard me, um, at, particularly at budget time, and you will continue to hear me at budget time, that our opportunities for efficiencies um, are something that we're always on the lookout for. I, I continue to think that the efficiencies with increased cooperation primarily with the county are where we're going to be able to see further ways to stretch our uh, our tax resources and uh, my my reading of the literature is is that um, consolidation uh, discussion usually only occurs at, at, at crisis points in, in communities where there's a cathartic event where something really uh, bad has happened in a community whether it's uh, poor government or poor economy or those types of things and then everybody gets excited about um, consolidation and then when things are 
are uh, moving along relatively well. We don't really focus very much on that. I think that's unfortunate, but that's kind of the, maybe that there's probably some life lessons in there as well, but um, I hope that we can continue to have active discussions about how we can look for efficiencies, avoiding duplicate uh, taxation for, for similar services. You, you, we've heard about that. We've talked about it. We've had individual discussions. We haven't really had very much in the way of corporate discussions. We've had very little community discussion about it. And I, I hope that in, at the appropriate forums and at the appropriate time, we can continue that. Again, this is really wasn't Michael's charge in that in that report. I kind of right. ag agree with agree with his items. We, we, we want to have better agreements and we want to have strong checklists. We do a lot of things very well. Um, we do a lot of the, the handshake agreements where um, I agree to do this and Craig agrees to do that and it just happens and it, and it works well. And you know, some of those things probably need to be formalized. I think Michael's pointing out that that's correct and others don't and he points that out as, as well. So I, I, I don't take, I don't take disagreement with the report. I just want to see <coughs> us move forward um, in this area in the future. So we're not gonna happen, nothing's gonna happen tonight. Probably nothing's gonna happen this month, maybe not this year, but um, I think that we will uh, get more. This community has very high expectations for its uh, municipal governments. We wanna keep that high, um, but we also um, are gonna be challenged with resources and we wanna look for, for efficiencies and you have also heard me talk about the, the duplicate taxation issues as well. As, and uh, public administration usually boils down to two words, who pays? And that's a fair question um, uh, for this issue. It probably is the question for this issue. So I, I don't wanna uh, monopolize the, the last uh, agenda item here and, and, and look forward to your discussion on this as well. But um, I want an opportunity to uh, say that, try to say it in, a, in, in the letter as well. So thank you. If I could, along with what David said, um, you know, Mike, Michael, I appreciate the report and, and you know, how um, uh, agreements need to be handled, you know, in the future. And, and I appreciate things that you pointed out. But Dave, rather than wait until budget time next year to talk about better ways to cooperate with uh, uh, county and uh, county government, I think that uh, we probably ought to have those discussions now. You know, we kind of get all in the middle of budget time and they kind of, it's got to take a little bit of a back seat. And I know that there's some things that, uh, you know, both the county and the city, uh, both governing bodies and city and county staff feel uh, really important about different things that, you know, we could have stronger cooperation with now and maybe even, uh, uh, you know, individually taking control of uh, uh, various parts of the government, uh, one over the other, so that both of us aren't doing a duplication. So I think that we ought to have those discussions now uh, rather than wait until we get in the middle of um, uh, budget time next year. Yeah. It's, it's always better to have these conversations when we're not under stress, That's especially right. these financial yeah. ones. If I Craig on down, we'll have a nice discussion. Yeah. I, I think I'm this is call it particularly important uh, <coughs> at, because uh, I think when you go through something like this and you have a checklist, you have the ability to do it. Um, if you know government intergovernment cooperation sometimes can be a personality driven it can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing right now personalities get along <clears> very well and i think uh, if there's a time where there is a discordance there i think this type of cooperative agreement we're looking at things in a very pragmatic and very specific way would minimize any of those difficulties that might occur in the future and i think that's always good uh, to try to increase our cooperation, and I think this would do that. So uh, I think uh, the report was a very nice report in that respect. Very good. Thank you, Chair. I may say that one of the things that I've been the most excited about in hearing this report is, is to have the opportunity to say that there's not a lot of public conversation that happens between the three governing bodies that exist in our community. So the school district, county and city commissions. Um, and I think there's an opportunity there for us to try to figure out a way to do that better. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the rules are and having joint meetings in a sense with different governing bodies, but I think that there's, I think that's necessary. Uh, you know, the, the, the school district and the county and city commissions work uh, is very intertwined with one another, but yet very separate. And so um, 
I don't think I don't think we need to be looking back a year from now on this saying, gosh, we we probably should have had different conversations or, or any at all. Um, so I don't know what the I don't know what the answer there is, but I guess I would just throw out for our consideration at a later point, perhaps in the fall, to figure out how we might be able to do that and what we might be able to accomplish. Um, because there's a lot of important work that's done between those governing bodies, and I think that it could be done more effectively and more streamlined um, if, if we were to have those conversations in public with everybody, rather than just you know, via a phone call when something happens. Um, in trying to get it figured out. So I know Dave and Craig talk all the time, and you know, Dave probably talks to Rick Dole all the time too, and Craig probably talks to Rick, and et cetera, et cetera. But, but I think it's important for us um, to, to have that conversation to be included in it as well. Agreed. Yes, Mike. And Commissioner, uh, several years, I don't know how long ago it was, we used to have, what, an annual or semi-annual meetings with the uh, other governing bodies, but I think, uh, I'll, you know, we can go back to something like that where we can talk about, you know, various, uh, you know, projects important to all three of the, the governing bodies or even problems, you know, the other, you know, government, you know, levels of government that uh, may be having troubles with things and need help in. But I do think one thing is we look at, you know, uh, the state government and we're fortunate to be able to have a project to uh, uh, finish the interchange at the uh, west end of uh, Bob Billings a minute ago and, and appreciate all the help that we're going to get there. The truth of the matter is, is that the strength in, in government is probably going to happen more from the local and, and the way that we combine efforts and get things done. So, uh, you know, that cooperation between the various levels locally are going to be the best way of being able to get those things done. So I think if there's a way to go back and, and, and start those uh, meetings on, on some kind of regular basis, I think that that would be good. Well, but it can't, to, to me, it can't be, it can't be an ego driven thing in the sense that you know, I don't think meetings are productive to talk about all the things that we've accomplished that have been great. I mean, I see like an issue as economic development with what the school district has going on. I mean, we, I mean, I think that, you know, Bob, you've been a part of those meetings with the Joint Economic Development Council, and that really was a collaborative effort amongst two governing bodies, but the school district now is kind of this third part um, with their new center that they're gonna have wherever they're gonna put it. And so I think that conversation, how, how can we best work together to facilitate a community conversation centered around working together towards a common goal of economic development. What things policy-wise can we do? What things policy-wise can the school district do and the county itself do um, to, to, to mobilize each other and our resources and the knowledge that each staff from those three governing bodies has and, and the political will to, to really to push forward certain agendas about what we all kind of want to share, you know, be, what, what we all want to uh, accomplished together in the community. Nobody in the election this year was not talking about economic development. Everybody was, even the school district. I mean, it, it, this was a part of things that they said. So, 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 how can we take that political will and 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 do something with it? I, I think one other thing that I would add, and I, I agree with Jeremy, and I think he makes very good statements. Uh, but the, also the University of Kansas yeah. would be an important aspect of this as an independent body. Uh, with governmental ties, and I think they're probably almost, if not important, just as important as the other two, or, or all three of the other of us uh, in, as a governing body. So I think we've gone ways of uh, increasing the communication with the university over the years. I think we should, uh, when we consider these other two, I think we should consider that as a fourth. Great point. Thank you. You know, Michael, one of the one of the areas that I think that uh, we showed a lot of cooperation, I didn't see it on your list, was when we were trying to locate the shelter and the county. I mean, uh, probably that was more informal than anything. They ended up buying the land and then making it available for us to, to purchase. So there's there's lots of things that go on there, but I, I thought that was a, uh, I, I thought that was tremendous co cooperation to, to get that very difficult site located and, and uh, it's up and running now. So. Pretty cool stuff. All right. That's it. You want to uh, motion to accept Michael's report? Moved. Second. Oh, public comment. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Everyone is gone. You're here still. I'm sorry. <laughs> um,
KT Walsh. I would just like to uh, remind everybody that if we're talking about our county, there are three universities. There's Baker, Haskell Indian Nations, and KU. So I think it would be appropriate that everyone be included. Thank Thanks, you. Sure. Thank you. Keeping us on track. Uh, any other com comment? Okay, so uh, presentation receipt. Second. Sean, second by Farmer. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next is general public comment. Do we have any this evening? This is ridiculous, but um, no, it's and I'll, not. I'll keep it short. I would like to talk about the railroad spur at um, 6th and Kentucky about. Mm -hmm. um, I went down to the journal world and at least the front office told me they no longer use it to bring in paper like they used to. Um, they have it all brought in by semi trucks. And I've noticed how much it slows down traffic. Out of towners don't know, they can't stop um, where the spur is. Um, if you've ever been caught up short behind a school bus or a public bus, and there are three places where buses have to stop by law, and um, it's just a bit of a jam, and it, it looks like it's in pretty bad shape. So I stopped David Cronin out here because I thought I needed to get on his agenda about traffic. He said, no, no, that's a KDOT issue. And he said, and KDOT can do it, they can exempt it. Meaning they put up signs that say, this is no longer a crossing, you no longer have to stop. So I'm bringing it up just as a suggestion. We briefly discussed it at um, the Lawrence Association of Neighborhoods and the police officers told us that they thought there was some mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it'd be a good thing for a future agenda or to hand off to staff. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we talked about it recently, yes, Dave? Not, yeah, well, we, 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 we did. We believe we um, are having good discussions with the appropriate parties about the removal of those railroad yeah. tracks. Um, it, it doesn't move as quick as some trains, but um, <laughs> we are having good discussions. I think K KT's got a very good point. I mean, I think, the, uh, I think it's been several years since uh, the wool companies received any deliveries. Uh, via train, uh, not that I look out the window all the time and watch it, but I think it's been, well, it's been a long time. So um, we'll, we're having communications with uh, the, the right folks, uh, World Company, and then also um, BNSF, and um, hope to be able to give you some more information and appreciate KT mentioning it. I think that the exemption would be something that we could pursue if it doesn't look like we're gonna get the train tracks removed. Yeah. But that's, that's our desire because there's a, um, there's probably some confusion among some people about whether that's active or not. We've got some people that know that it's okay to pull over them, and then they also then there's other people that know that the law says no, you can't stop on them when there's a, a uh, uh, when they're stopped with, at a traffic signal. So there's uh, the, we think the right thing to do is if they're not going to be used, is to seek their removal. Agreed. I w I would agree. I I've, I've seen I've go down that road a lot and and when people stop unexpectedly and it's not unexpected for the bus driver but it's unexpected for the large car behind them uh, I've seen a couple times where um, there could have been an accident there so I I, I agree with them comments of removing them okay um, well you'll update us when you have any further yes. progress thanks KT all right any other public comment future agenda items you see those listed uh, commissioners there for our meeting on the, the 27th. Uh, your public incentive review committee uh, favorably recommended the uh, proposed uh, property tax abatement for, for sunlight uh, at this afternoon's meeting. So you'll be having the public hearing on that um, next week. The city staff's recommending some changes on our laws regarding upholstered furniture on porches. Um, and a few other items there as well. Very good. And I told Dave this this afternoon, I'll be coming back from Chicago next Tuesday, okay. and I should be back, but... Um, we'll get started without you if you don't show up. If I, my plane doesn't show up, I won't be here. We're, so. not, we're not waiting. Please don't. <laughs> we hope you make it back. Uh, 
far as commission items go, there's one thing I needed to bring up based on um, the recommendation uh, from PERC today. We uh, made a positive recommendation for the sunlight abatement, uh, but it brought up a good point and one I want to address with the commission in that we selected a $5 million cutoff for the evaluation of these types of um, incentives in the past and in, in the recent past, in the last uh, four or five years we did that. Uh, one thing I'd like the commission to discuss is perhaps uh, reassessing that number based on um, the fact that this case, uh, there was unanimous approval of a, of a company that was probably half of that uh, $5 million um, cut off. So um, we, we thought that it would be important for us to recognize that we um, deviated from that and that perhaps the commission wanted to reevaluate the cutoff for consideration for public incentives of this nature. So I wanted to bring that up and see about um, either discussing it at a meeting or having staff prepare a, a new set of standards or maybe revisit the minutes where we created that $5 million distinction and um, determine maybe what surrounded that and, and perhaps how what we did today may uh, confuse that issue a little bit. Mayor, one of the things too that we that, that was brought up right at the end of that meeting also was uh, with that five million uh, five million dollar threshold on the investment side was also to uh, have discussion about special consideration given to the small businesses coming out of the uh, uh, BTBC mm -hmm. as uh, because this is our our first business to you know uh, graduate from uh, the facility and, and see if if there is a different standard that should be used on considering those businesses for special incentives. Right. So. And, and part of this is we haven't had that many uh, tax abatement requests recently. Um, not to mention, I think the nature of the small business startup has changed and the necessary uh, infrastructure improvements and investments are lower maybe now than we maybe originally anticipated or or maybe we wanted to focus on large scale manufacturing, uh, but in reality, maybe the future of our business development opportunities will be uh, technology and business and smaller level incentives. So first with the BTBC uh, graduates, and then maybe even consider any small business that is looking for uh, either growth or re um, establishing roots here in Lawrence or just moving here in general. I, 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 would, like, I would like maybe us to consider that um, cut off, but but uh, but I think it's something the commission needs to decide because we the, we are the ones that the, the the city commission set the standard historically, and I think we need to probably change it if we're gonna um, continue to yeah, you know, I, assess it. Let's just have the staff come back to us with uh, all the information that surrounds it and make an adjustment to it if that's what we want to do. So. All right, so I'm, I'm informally requested if it's okay the staff to take a look at our, uh, the minutes revolving or surrounding that decision and then uh, maybe revisit that. And when you have that report back, I think one of the items we're going to ask you is whether or not you want to refer it to the Joint Economic Development Council. One of their charges is to look at economic development policy. You, you all will decide whether or not it's uh, you know, of, of an appropriate level or not. I mean, some people might think it's fine tuning, some might think it's a, a larger policy issue. You all, can, you all can decide that when you get our report, whether or not you want to refer it on to, okay, okay. to them. So anyway, that came up tonight. I, was, I, I told them that I would bring it to the commission level today. Any other uh, commission items? Besides you might miss the meeting next week. Uh, the calendar, anything we need to be discussing here? You should. The rental registration meeting in, in this room yes, sir. tomorrow. I'll be there. I'm going to try to be five to six, five to yeah. seven, something like that. Five to six. Five to six. Five to six. Okay. Very good. Anything, uh, anything else uh, to discuss on the calendar? If not, uh, is there a motion to Moved. adjourn the meeting? Moved. Second. 
Motion adjourn the meeting by Commissioner Shum, seconded by Vice Mayor Amix. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 5-0.